All right. Welcome back for part three of The Author World. It is so good to see you guys back here. And thank you so much for having your videos open. It's nice to see all your beautiful faces. I really appreciate that. It means a lot to me. It's good to have the energy here in the room as well. And me and my team, we're here to serve again. I really appreciate the acknowledgement of Roddy's pretty amazing accent. And uh, he certainly is wonderful to listen to. I love listening to him as well. And Vladdy and Kayla, because they have such great insights too. And and if you happen to get on early, you get the early show by listening to these wonderful beings. So today we're going to talk about part three. And this is a really fun part. Whether you've thought about this or not for yourself, I really want you to open up your mind because it is a lot easier than you think to uh, to have a book and have it made into a movie or a series or a documentary. And that's what we're going to talk about and Eva, you are right. Kayla has the most beautiful smile. Uh, we will be addressing questions as well today. So I'm going to head over to my PowerPoint presentation and share with you some of the things that I have to share with you to inspire you into action. That was one of the things that Vladi and Roddy and Kayla were talking about just before we started today about the importance of moving into action. And um, and it's, you know, as I said yesterday, it may not be perfect, but do it anyway. And when you're creating your results, your outcomes, I suggest that create them with the understanding that this is going to be massive. This is going to be life changing. This is going to be world renowned, whether it's like the book that E.L. James, her real name is Erica Mitchell, released that took off and sold more books in one year than any previous author had done. There's always records to be broken. Think about uh, J.K. Rowling became the first the world's first billionaire author. Um, she proved it is possible. There are many, many authors that have earned hundreds of millions of dollars doing things that they love, doing work that they love. And so whether you're a storyteller or not, whether you're a children's book author, whatever area or genre that you're in, you could also move to this field. And you know, thank you, Rhea. I really appreciate that. That's very kind of you. Like the wonderful thing about today, this day and age is that we have so much support and we can get so much help out there in the world from the resources that are there, whether it's through us and, and going through our programs or working with me privately, or whether it is also tapping into the powerful use of chat GPT, which is incredible and magnificent. And if anyone's using it, I'm certain you already know how incredible it is. I love that the masked mystic who's been on here every day this week moved into action. And prior to us starting today, had shared with us that um, moved into action. Let me see if I can find the exact text that he had shared uh, to us, uh, really expressing uh, gratitude for the event and feeling very inspired as well, which I really love. That's something that it just fuels me knowing that I'm making a difference out there and that in some way, whatever way that is, whether it's here on these calls, whether this is your first time, we actually had a lot of people register for this that had never been on any of our webinars before. Either way, that's what I'm here for is to move you into action so that you can enjoy the things that every one of you deserves, you know, whatever that is. You know, I think about how being an author has absolutely changed my life professionally, but it's also changed my life personally as well. And I find that it you'll you'll see that it inspires those around you as well, whether they're your relatives or children or grandchildren or who they may be. It certainly is inspiring. In fact, I was talking to my grandson on the weekend. That's Kayla's son about him writing a book. And uh, and so uh, seeing his mother is an author and his grandmother, maybe he will decide to do that. I know one of my nieces, uh, when she turned 10, became an international best-selling author and it occurred on her 10th birthday. And so she went to school as an international best-selling author on her 10th birthday. And how exciting was that? right? Your daughter, uh, Vladdy Elizabeth, just turned 10. Maybe it's her turn to write a book as well. But either way, let's go and take a look at an opportunity that every one of you has, and that is to potentially have your book be made into a movie or a series, etc. 
Now, you may think that's harder than than you think, but absolutely it is not. And I'll share with you in a little bit how I've recently written a couple screenplays as well and had never written screenplays before, but how uh, relatively easy it was. I'm going to tell you what the process was that I used. So those of you that have already written your books, you may want to take a look at using this as well. So the opportunities that we've been talking about all week are really for anyone right? And this is one of the things I love about this industry is the only prerequisite is desire. But also, if you want to get results, you have to make decisions, as we heard Vladdy talk about the other day, and uh, make a committed decision and then move into action. So when we look at the, the many, many, many authors that had written books that have either been adapted into a film or a motion picture or a series or a documentary, they all have something in common. They moved into action. You know, they got their book done. They may have been fearful. And that actually is one of the common things that authors are dealing with. And, and what they're dealing with is potential rejection. They also deal with the uh, criticism, perhaps. And maybe some of you have that. I know it's pretty common. I remember when I was getting ready to release my first book, I was, you know, feeling you know, a little concerned, what are other people going to think of it? But you have to really move past that. What they think of it is none of your business and it really doesn't matter. And it's the same thing when you're, uh, you know, maybe you if you're working on a screenplay as well. But you may think of the question like, do I have to do a screenplay if I want to have my book turned into a movie? And the answer is no, you don't have to do a screenplay if you'd like your book to be turned into a movie but it helps. And so that was one of the reasons why I created a couple screenplays myself, because it, it just sort of helps Hollywood with the next step, which would be to create a screenplay for the, for the, for the book or for, yeah, for the book. So I want to show you some slides of authors, individuals, just like you and me that had an idea moved into action, got their book done, and they were made into movies. Now, some of these you're definitely going to recognize because they're quite big successes. And you may or may not have known that they were first first uh, books. But of course, we know that J.K. Rowling has done a whole series of books called Harry Potter, which has gone way beyond the book. It actually became a franchise. And you'll see Harry Potter stores. In fact, Kayla and I were in one last week. There's Harry Potter World. You know, there's now rides. There's movies. And so you just never know where it's going to go. So what I suggest to people is to do what it says behind my head here, uh, where I sit every single day. And you can certainly read that sign, right? Dream big, baby, dream big. If that's something that you would love, then dream it, right? Think about what Walt Disney used to say. He used to say, dream it. And that's what he did, that he dreamt up Disney World, just one man, and he dreamt up Disney World. And so it all starts in the mind of man or human, human. I don't mean like men, not women. Or <laughs> You get the point, right? <laughs> okay, James Patterson created uh, many, many books, uh, Alex Cross series. I actually like James Patterson's novels and I've read several of them. And he actually, it was estimated that $800 million in earnings from his book sales alone, never mind the movies that were adapted from that. So just from his book sales, 800 million. Now that gentleman's living a pretty good life, I'd say, right? And uh, just using his imagination and uh, actually took a, a course with James Patterson on how to write fiction. And that's the thing, you wanna go to the people that have been there, done that, and you know, already got the t-shirt and they know what they're talking about because it can be more valuable. Stephen King, many of you are very familiar with that. It's estimated that his personal net worth is over 500 million. And he really does have too many books to mention, you know, books that have been made into movies uh, as well. Uh, many of them, uh, Erica Mitchell is E.L. James, Fifty Shades of Grey, and one year from June 12, 2012 to 2013, after releasing her first book, it was reported that she had earned $95 million and sold more than 70 million copies in the first eight months, unheard of, but she did it, and then movies were made from it, uh, a series came out of it, it was a, and still is, a relatively huge success, and and she was highly criticized for her writing. You know, it was reported that her writing style was not great. You know, I just want to stop here for a moment and talk about using a pen name. You know, sometimes authors will ask me, you know, should I use a pen name 
when I'm writing my book and I, and I say, why? You know, because if you're going to be, you know, in the public, which is likely going to happen when your book hits the big time and you're going to be doing interviews, they're going to know what your name is anyway. So use your name. Just use your name. Uh, like in in uh, Erica Mitchell's case, we know her name is Erica Mitchell, but she goes by the pen name E.L. James. Now, some people choose to use a pen name because they do want to remain anonymous. They don't want anyone to know that they wrote that book. But it becomes increasingly more challenging to promote a book if the author is attempting to hide uh, behind their name. So just keep that in mind. Can it be done? Sure, it's been done many, many, many times before. Uh, but just keep that in mind uh, if you're considering that uh, for sure. Okay, let's keep rocking and rolling here. Today, we'll have a lot more time to take questions as well. Uh, Life of Pi, I don't know if you've seen that movie. This is a Canadian and like me and Kayla. And uh, uh, he wrote this uh, novel and it was considered unadaptable due to its fantastical and philosophical content. But a director by the name of Ang Lee took it took on that challenge and created a visually stunning film that won several, several Academy Awards. And that movie generated over $600 million. So this idea that it can't be done, this is what I've talked about. I talked about it yesterday. I talked about the day before is most people, never mind authors, but most people are in their own way. They're in their own way. They've already decided that it won't work or can't work or whatever other belief system that they're hanging on to, thinking that that's somehow helping them in some way. It doesn't. Negative beliefs are destructive. I had it in my presentation yesterday. I had it in my presentation the day before. It's not that you won't feel them. Okay, we have to understand this. You may feel a tremendous amount of fear. You may feel a tremendous amount of doubt. You may feel anxious. You might feel those things. And it's not uncommon to feel those things, but you have to go past it. You have to just say, okay, you know what? This is more important and you have to believe in your work. You really have to believe in your work, whether it's fiction or nonfiction. And even if you aren't a great writer, that's okay. Use ChatGPT to help you edit your work or find a really great editor to work with you to help them or help you spruce up your work. So there's always a way. It's like that statement. There's always a way when you are committed. There's always a way when you are committed. So create the scene in your mind of what does that outcome look like? What is it that you really, really, really want? And get emotionally involved in that as an outcome, as if it's already done. Here's a few more movies that have been made, uh, books that were made into movies. Uh, the Hunger Games, uh, the whole that whole series. Uh, Lord of the Rings, uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, that's an older one, Gatsby, and some books that were written many, many years ago have been made into movies and then remade, you know, with, with more current actors and things like that. Now, I could fill pages. There are literally thousands and thousands and thousands of authors that have had their books made into movies, thousands of them. And as I said one day this week, it may have been in one of our calls, I, I mentioned that Hollywood needs the stories, right? They're constantly looking for great stories, great content. Why? Because that's the business they're in. They're in the business of making movies. And so where do the movies come from? Human's imagination. And that's you. So you can use your imagination. That's why I made the decision to write Savvy Wisdom, which is inspired by my life, but I use my imagination, especially with the third book, because it's called Savvy Wisdom from Beyond. So I had to get really imaginative with that one. But here are other books that have been made into series, Outlander, The Handmaid's, uh, Handmaid's Tale, Game of Thrones, Big Little Lies, you know, and these are, as I said, are just samples. I could have invested days just gathering all kinds of different samples. And if you heard the stories, like the backstories, like people just like you and me got an idea and they moved forward with it, maybe felt that trepidation, but they took action anyway. Probably got the guidance that they needed as well. Documentaries that have been on television or, or in film, uh, like Michelle Obama's book, Becoming, um, the book called Into the Wild, and another one uh, called An Inconvenient Truth. I think that's by Al Gore. So all of these were uh, first an idea, 
that someone moved into action on and became a documentary series. A few more that I wanted to share with you. Uh, um, you may or may not be familiar with, with this one. Uh, it's a, a movie called Room. And a Emma Donahue was a successful novelist before transitioning to screenwriting. So she actually wrote the screenplay for her novel, Room. And it was inspired by news stories that she had seen about children being held captive. And so what she did was she adapted her own novel into a screenplay for Room. And it won many awards. It won four Academy Awards, including Best Picture, pretty significant. It won Best Actress for Brie Larson. And she was nominated for Best Adapted screenplay. So this should probably inspire you, Mark Wallace, who's on the call right now, because this is exactly what Mark's doing. Mark is on the call with us right now. Maybe if he wants to share, we'll bring him in a little bit later. But he got an idea, moved into action, and not only is so working on the novel, but the screenplay as well, and has the vision. He's already created this vision of what it all is going to look like uh, at, the, uh, at the end. So it's pretty exciting. Uh, here's another one, Juno. You may be familiar with that one. Diablo Cody was a blogger and a memoirist and with no prior screenwriting experience at all and wrote Juno. And after being noticed for her unconventional writing style, and it was a hit. It was a major indie success that grossed over 230 million worldwide. And it won the Academy Award for Best Original Screenplay. Um, and so... You know, it's, it's pretty exciting when you see these stories. Here's another one, Little Miss Sunshine by Michael Arndt. And the background was a former production assistant and script reader. So was familiar with scripts, um, but decided to, uh, you know, refine Little Miss Sunshine. And this book was a surprise hit in 2006, earned over 100 million and won the Academy Award for Best Original Screenplay. Pretty cool. Now we can go on and on and on and on with these examples but you know really what they all have in common is that they moved into action they may not have known how to do a screenplay or how to write the book in the first place what's the structure etc but somehow some way they found their way and they created phenomenal success so the next one it's in the genes says jackie g the next one could be you and not only you it is something that every one of you could do. Every single one of you can do, including Roddy and Kayla and Vladdy as well. In fact, they're already thinking about it, probably working on it too. I got into screenwriting uh, not that long ago. I was working with a private client of mine from Ireland, actually a lovely woman. And uh, she was working on a book um, about leprechauns. And I'd been working with her for quite a while. And uh, Phil Goldfein, who is my good friend from Hollywood, who's an Academy Award winning producer, had said to her, her name is Rita. He said to Rita, he said, you know, I've always wanted to do a movie about leprechauns. And she said, I'll write the book. <laughs> and so she moved into action and she wrote the book. Now, she's a lawyer by trade. She's not a writer. This was not something that she'd been doing for years and years and years. So she moved into action and she uh, she wrote the book. So I sent the book to Phil and Phil read it and he said, OK, there's some areas of challenge here and, you know, need to fix this, need to do that, et cetera. And and so when I told Rita that she was like, oh, you know, like that seems like a lot of work and I can understand that. Right. It's like, oh. And so she probably wanted to hear, oh, it's perfect and it's wonderful. And let's just rock and roll with this thing and, and put it into a, a movie. But that wasn't his response. And I said, that's OK. You know, like sometimes that's what it's like. Sometimes the road to success is a little bumpy. Sometimes it feels like you're taking a detour. Sometimes it feels like you're going backward. But nonetheless, what do you have to do? You have to persist, right? You got to keep going and keep going and keep going. So I said to Rita, leave it with me. And what I did was I totally revised her book based on the feedback. Now, I don't do that as a service, by the way. This is not something that I'm offering to anyone. This is a private mentoring client of mine that I am working with. And even if you are a private mentoring client, I don't write your books. <laughs> but with Rita, she had put my name on the cover because she felt that I had earned my name on her cover. So it ended up becoming a joint project. <laughs> and so... And I fell in love with Rita and her story and her book. So I got involved uh, as well. And I rewrote her book. 
And then we kind of like nailed the story. So then I got the idea, I'm going to write a screenplay. And I had never written a screenplay before. I've read them. And I decided to write the screenplay and I used chat GPT to help me. And the thing is with chat GPT is when you own the rights to the story, what you can do is upload the story into chat GPT and let it know what you're doing, that you're actually writing a screenplay based on this novel. And that's what I did. And so over a period of time in several days, me and chat GPT got to work and I wrote the screenplay for uh, the, the story. It's called The Lost Valley, and it's about leprechauns. It's a really cute story. I'm in love with the story. And so um, we're sending that over to Phil now. Then I because I had done that, I thought, well, Savvy Wisdom has already, I've sold the rights for the motion picture, but the screenplay is not done yet. And there was one gentleman that was on it, and he ended up getting pushed off the project because of some issues. And and so I thought, well, I'm going to make an attempt at writing the screenplay for my own books, Savvy Wisdom. And so I did the same thing. I uploaded them into ChatGPT. Now, by the way, I want to just clear something. You know, some people think that if you upload your book into ChatGPT, that it's now available for the world. Not true. Absolutely not true. OK, I add I added on or I uploaded a, a PDF file or a Word file and it does not make it available for anyone in the world. But frankly, the books are available for anyone in the world to buy anyways. And certainly people could buy a Kindle version. But someone recently said to me, oh, that means that your book's now out there in the world and anybody can have it. It's like, no. And I've copywritten, like I've copyright protected my book. So my book is fine. There's no issue with that. It's all legal. In fact, I went and asked Chappie, chat GPT, is this all legal? Like, can I use this? Is this a legitimate screenplay? It's like, yes. So what I did was I did it scene by scene. So it's not like chapter, it's scene by scene by scene. Now, first of all, I did some studies, some research on what's required in a screenplay. How are they structured? I had read one before. I mean, it's not rocket science, right? We're not building a shape, ship to go to the moon or something like that. We're, it's a screenplay, for goodness sakes. Like, we're, we use a lot of common sense in the creation of both a book and a screenplay. And so, and similar to, you know, to when you're writing a graphic novel is people need to see it, right? And when you think about what is a screenplay, I mean, this is really... Uh, really different from a book because it has to be cinematic. I mean, the, the people that are going to actually produce the movie and direct the movie are going to use the screenplay. Everyone's going to have the screenplay. So yeah, you have to set the scene. You have to talk about what's going on in the scene and then like opening scene and then fade out and you do the dialogue and all of that. And, uh, and there's certain sort of rules in writing screenplay too. Like in other words, if there's somebody in the scene who's thinking something, well, no one would know that because we can't read minds, right? And so there's certain things that are that you learn along the way. And, and so I wrote the screenplay and I sent it to my good friend, Phil, because uh, we, were, we were heading down to LA to do an event down there. And I sent it over to him and, and he said he loved it. In fact, he was quite impressed <laughs> with what I had created, which was wonderful to hear. I was very grateful for that. He said he needed to tighten up some of the dialogue that was in it, but definitely something that they can work with. So it helps move the projects forward, right? And that's what Mark Wallace is doing as well as he's, uh, you know, he's he's actually already has a contract as well um, with, uh, with Hollywood uh, to have his story be made into a movie, into a motion picture. So he's already ahead of the game, but he got his contract actually before the book was written and before the screenplay was written. So you may be asking, well, how does that happen? And how it happens is because uh, he, he is a private client of mine, a private mentoring client, and uh, he did come to an event that I was doing with Phil. So he got right there, like up close and personal and Phil got to know Mark and who he is and where his heart is and his brilliant mind and the ideas that he had and loved it, like absolutely fell in love with his idea. And so how that happened. And that's why, you know, who you're hanging out with. I know Kayla had talked about that the other day as well, is that, you know, how important it is to be in the right environment for success as well. And that's one of the things I love about working with authors and creatives is that, 
you you know, they get to know each other, right? And hang out with each other. In fact, we had an author Q&A call a couple hours ago. And one of the lovely ladies who's in that program was mentioning that she's still in touch with the people that were at the event in Hollywood. They've developed such a close bond together, which is beautiful. And they can help support each other, maybe do some introductions. You know, you never know where it's going to go. But the whole point is you have to build the dream first, right? You have to fall in love with what the idea is. Diane's saying, which version of Chat Cheap? Yes, I have the paid one. I use the paid one. It's $20 a month. It's like the best $20 I've ever, ever, ever spent. It's uh, OpenAI, uh, Chat GPT version, whatever it is for. I know they got some newer versions there, but that is definitely the one that I use. But it's very exciting. It really is exciting to get into this, this uh, industry and to be expressive of that. And, you know, in my mind, as you can see behind me here on the shelf, I've already imagined, you know, that my book, um, book series, Savvy Wisdom, which has been adapted into a movie, has already won Best Picture. And in my Power Life script uh, that I listen to every single day, I reinforce, you know, how it's made such a uh, making and made such a, a positive and beneficial contribution to the lives of hundreds of millions of people around the world and that it's a classic, et cetera. And so it all starts in the mind. All of it starts in the mind. And throughout the last three days that we've been blessed to be here together, I really want to thank you for giving me your attention and for joining in the author world is that you've heard me talk about the importance of mindset. And it's the foundation for everything. It's the foundation for everything that I do, whether I'm working with an entrepreneur who's growing their business or another coach who's looking to expand their business and grow their revenues, or whether it's an author or someone who just wants help, you know, turning things around in their life. Like either way, it's all about the mindset. Roddy talked about that before we started the class today. It really is an attitude and I talked about it the other day when when I decided to write Savvy Wisdom, the first thing I asked myself is, do I want to? And the answer was, yes, absolutely, I want to do this. And then I asked myself, what do I need to believe in order for this to go well and for this to be a great product? And so I asked myself that question and I realized that it really came down to attitude. I had to have the right attitude about it. I had to believe in me. I had to believe in my ability to write it. I had to believe that it was going to be fun and enjoyable because if you're going to do it, might as well have fun, right? And then I needed to believe that it was uh, a great uh, book, like a really great book that people would love and and not want to put down, like the real page turner uh, as well. So all of that does come from attitude and it's something that you have to grab a hold of. And that's why I mentioned to you guys yesterday that when I decided on Tuesday evening, you know, to create that million dollar author blueprint for you, at first I thought I, it was like a dialogue that I was having in my own mind. Like, what are you crazy? Like it's 417 in the afternoon, you know, like that's a little ridiculous, uh, Peggy. And, and, uh, and then I just said, well, do you want to? <laughs> and there was a part of me that did not want to. I was like, no, no, you don't want to. You want to relax. You want to enjoy your evening. And, <clears throat> but you can still enjoy your evening in the writing process. And in fact, even though I was feeling at that time, kind of tired it energized me i just felt so invigorated by doing it and that is one of the great gifts of being an author or being a screenwriter is just how you feel when you get it done right like that sense of accomplishment that you feel i see vladdy's nodding her head vladdy can i bring you into the spotlight i want to bring you in my beauty so Vladdy, I mean, you know this really well, right? Like you've written fairy tales, for goodness sakes. Like what inspired that idea and what was going on in your mind with that dialogue before you actually moved into action? Were you thinking, this is crazy. Like I've never written a fairy tale book before. Yeah, it was. And you know, I always, uh, my, my total inspiration was kids. And I'm one of those moms who only buys books that are very, 
beneficial, uh, great message. So no offense to any authors, but I'm very careful about books. I've read to them ever since they were born. So obviously there was inspiration was what if my grand, it was actually idea of my grandchildren reading my books more than my kids. Because I kind of liked the idea that my grandparents, we grew up with stories and they were telling us stories. It was more talking stories or they would read us the old stories and it stuck with me forever. Like those stories, I can still hear the messages through the stories that I've heard. And I thought I'd love my grandkids to actually read and say, oh, my grandma written a book. So it wasn't actually my own kids that inspired me so much as my grandchildren, which I don't even have. I mean, my kids are quite small, so <laughs> but we're supposed to think from the end. And I was gifted actually uh, a book that an author in Czechoslovakia lost the rights. And, you know, it was written in a very old fashioned way, quite scary. And somebody gave it to me and they said, this is yours. Bring it to English and recreate the story. So I do acknowledge her actually in the book. And I got into spirit of writing with it. And I like to talk about her because it's moral. It doesn't have to be legal. I've got all the legal rights, but I wanted to really give her a, because she kind of prompted the start. And I just love it. I love writing and I will not stop. <laughs> I love it. It's so good. But don't you find that, I'm going to bring Kayla in as well, because, you know, all of us are authors and I mentioned on day one that one of the things that I felt when I was writing my first book is I had this thought. Uh, it, it wasn't that I didn't care that no one read it, but I felt so good about doing the actual result, like writing the book. It just, I just felt good about myself. Like it was a confidence builder. Is that what you found as well? Did you find that Kayla? Absolutely. You know, it's, it's really funny because when I wrote my book, if you would have asked me when I was a child or when I was going through high school, if I could have been an author, the answer would have been uh, no. <laughs> like, it wasn't even a thought in my mind that, that I could be an author, but I didn't have the guidance yet. I didn't have the belief within me that I could do something or produce something like that, you know, because it really took meeting Peggy for that to happen. Yeah, that's so good. I'm so glad you did it. And, you know, also, and I'm sure, Vladdy, you experienced this as well, is that the impact that has on others around you, like Joshua and Elizabeth, seeing their mother follow through and, and do that. What what have they said about that or have they said anything about it? Oh, they've illustrated actually a pages and put it together with the stapler and said, this is my book and created the illustration. In fact, Elizabeth wants to be an editor. She loves Sherry's books. I know Sherry, I've seen her somewhere. So, you know, it's like I said, that's okay. <laughs> you need to go with, she loves her books with the kitty, but she likes the idea of writing a book. And she said, I want to publish my own fairy tale, like with the real publisher, like you, mommy. So oh. she already recognizes that there is a way she can do it. And it is inspiring. They do talk about the books in a school. So I think they are proud to say, my mommy writes books. So, you know, for them, it's kind of a something they are proud of. So it's great. It's it's really great. But what I, I think the last thing I will say, because Peggy wants to carry on, but it is the journey and the, who you become in a process of writing the book. It's challenging, but remember there is law of written. So just do what you can today and then move to the next step. And it's the most enriching journey because it's really tapped inside you. Wow, that's incredible. I love it. You mentioned Sherry, so I thought I'd bring her in. <laughs> Not like putting you on the spot there, Miss Sherry, oh. but every opportunity you have to do a plug for your book, I'd take it. <laughs> so, Sherry, why don't you share with us, like, how did that feel for you to get your first book done? Well, it, it was, it's an incredible feeling and it, because it, I think it was the purpose and the reason that I, that I book came out of the books, because it's actually a trilogy uh, it started out one story and then broken up into three books, but it's to help. Um, I'm an animal rescue advocate and it's to help. Mm. I like to help animals get forever homes and, and uh, get them out of the shelters and children to, to feel kindness towards animals and that sort of thing. Plus um, it starts out with a little girl that is bullied in school. 
So I, uh, when the first one came out, I mean, it was just incredible. I, and then the second one, <clears throat> there's the first one, there's Jasmine and Jasmine, the cat, she was, um, that's my cat. And she was in the shelter. Thank you, Peggy. She was, <laughs> I should be doing that for you. She was in the shelter for um, three years and she was released or she was uh, surrendered to the shelter at the age of four. So I got her at, uh, as she was seven years old, but she was in the shelter for three years. I mean, and so it's still not only is, are the books so very important and and I'm so excited about them, but whenever I see that cat, I still do it to this day. I did it earlier before I left for an appointment. But when I see that cat, I think, look at what this cat has done. I mean, mm -hmm. the cat, because yeah, I was inspired by her her plight and the plight of all animals that you know, are in sanctuaries and stuff. But it was this cat. And you know, I really think she knows what's going on and she appreciates it because she gets in my lap every night and puts her head down so I can kiss her head. Oh, I love that. That's so great. And you know, it's interesting because when you think about what happens sometimes when you become an author is like, it's like you've bitten an apple, you know, taken a bite out of an apple that has some kind of a magic in it that goes in you. Because like, how many books have you done now, Sherry? Well, I've three of them have been published and I've got uh, four more waiting. Wow. Incredible. Well, good for you. And I love that you're doing this work. You know, it it just really fills my heart to know that you're doing it for such a good purpose too. And and that's the, that's the fun thing about being an author, right? Is you put your passion behind it. Like we hear Vladdy talk about the importance of, of sharing the right kind of stories with your children. And you're doing this work, being an advocate for, for animals and not just kitty cats, but, you know, other animals too. Well, I've always, I've said, and this will be the last thing I say, but I've, I've always said I had, I had three different careers in my life and I loved every one of them. I mean, you know, everybody has a good or bad day at work. But I loved every one of them because I knew I was being helpful and I was doing a good job. But somebody said to me, what's the difference with between that and these the books? You know, you're you seem to be at your desk all the time and all that. I said, yes, but when you find your purpose, and that's what you just said, when you find your purpose, it's not work. Right. So good. Thank you, Sherry. I really appreciate you for being willing to share with us and to jump in the hot seat like like you did. Uh, thank you very, very much. Uh, Roddy also put the link for your uh, book over there in the chat box so anyone can check out uh, Sherry's books and read the incredible stories about Jasmine, her beautiful little kitty cat. Uh, there's a question here from Eva may ask, once you pay the illustrator and editor, et cetera, do you break even or earn even on the first book you put out there? Okay, we'll go to questions right now. Thanks, Vladdy. I'll probably call you back in a little bit later. Appreciate you and Kayla for jumping in like you did. And uh, we're gonna take questions now. I mentioned today we had a lot more time for questions. So we're gonna do the questions mm -hmm. now. I know Roddy's been gathering some. So we're gonna start with the questions. And and uh, Eva says, may I ask, once you pay the illustrator and the editor, do you break even? Okay, so, you know, it really depends. It's different for every single author. Absolutely different. Now, you got to understand, and we talked about this a bit yesterday, there's a lot of different money earning opportunities for authors. Now, there are a large majority of authors who do not earn back their the investment that they put in. And uh, and that's like anything in life, right? There's 97% of the population that's earning 3% of the money and 3% of the population is earning 97% of the money. Why is that? Well, it's mindset. Like it really does come down to mindset. And you also have to be very, very patient. Like Sherry had mentioned that this is kind of like her career now, but for many, many authors, I know for Kayla, it's the same. For Vladdy, it's the same. For myself is that this was not our full-time gig. You know, this was a part-time thing, something we do on the side. I know that's the, that's the case for, you know, Kayla and Vladdy. And like when I started doing my um, <clears throat> my first book, you know, I thought that, oh, I mean, this is going to be the ticket to the uh, easy street kind of thing. But no, you know, it took a little while before it took off. And then I discovered, hey, I can market online, which is 
fabulous. Anybody can market online. And that's what really started to make the difference. Uh, but there are other ways to earn. There's other ways to earn while you're writing your book in many, many different ways. Same thing with getting into Hollywood. It may be a while before you start earning money, whether you're whatever the structure is of the compensation plan that you've worked out with whoever it is that you're dealing with as well. So it's different for everyone. Uh, it depends on the illustrator. I know Kayla's hired illustrators, Vladdy's hired illustrators, uh, Sherry's hired illustrators. Depends on what you pay them. Depends on how much you're selling the book for. And of course, it always depends on how many books you're selling <laughs> because ultimately you do want it to be a profitable experience for sure. Um, so will you get rich by this? Well, some have, but it's, it is a small percentage uh, that have. However, there are other benefits to it as well. Like think about this if you're somebody who's in a field where being an expert or known as an expert can be very valuable uh, to potential clientele, new clientele. So it, it's, you know, I mentioned how important it is as far as a credibility builder. That's very important too. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. And, you know, you could also end up being an author that crosses genres. I remember when, my uh, my literary agent, my first literary agent, who's retired now, um, was formerly the president of HarperCollins. And uh, she had said to me when I decided to write a book on marketing, because I love marketing as well. So I'd written books on personal development and I decided to switch and write a book on marketing. And her advice was don't cross genres because nonfiction, self-help is one genre. Marketing is another genre. And I didn't listen to her, obviously, I wrote it anyways. And and so, you know, part of the reason is focus, I suppose, but could you cross genres? Absolutely. Uh, I think Wayne Dyer did children's books as well as, as well as he did movie. You know, if you've watched the movie that, that he's in and was created and uh, he's written many nonfiction books too, or had written many, many nonfiction books too. And of course, I've crossed genres. I went from nonfiction to fiction. So I've crossed uh, I've crossed genres that way as well. Okay, I'm going to go start answering all these questions that Roddy has been very kindly gathering for me. First one's from Barbara. Barbara said, I wonder, um, I wonder, could you use a ghostwriter to write a fiction book for you if you had an outline and synopsis of what you wanted the book to be about? If so, would you still own the rights to the book? This is a really good question. I don't know if you need a ghostwriter nowadays with chat GPT. Um, I would probably not hire a ghostwriter now. Uh, and I apologize if anyone on here is a ghostwriter. But, uh, you know, one of the things that's occurred since AI has come out is, you know, people have... Uh, lost their jobs you know their their business has gone down copywriters as an example like when i think about my business and i've been in business now 30 years one of my biggest expenses over the years has been copywriting and that's the stuff you see on web pages the stuff that's promoted things that are on social media the back cover of a book you know what's written there all of that is written by professional copywriters well, I don't think you need one anymore with the uh, with the internet, um, with chat GPT, pardon me. And so um, that's one of the things that I found to be so beneficial. It's like when I wrote the screenplay, could I have hired somebody to write the screenplay? Sure. It could have been a big expense as well, but I thought, well, I'll take a stab at it. And that's the thing, like when you bring your common sense in, when you get the right guidance, when you have the knowledge of what to do, it makes it a lot easier and it can save you an enormous amount of time and an enormous amount of money. And I have worked with ghostwriters before. I worked with ghostwriters many, many years ago, and they do not own the rights to your book, but it depends on the contract that you have with them. In my case, you know, they were paid a fee to write based on my guidance, which is kind of like what you're doing with chat GPT now. Like when I work with my ghostwriter, my ghostwriter was writing based on what I was giving her, the content, et cetera. And then she would go and structure it and write, you know, write the chapters, et cetera. You can do the same thing nowadays with chat GPT. So that's sort of my, uh, my take on that. And then you own all of the rights. Okay. Steve says, would you suggest using a product lunch structure if the book is for kids or rather if your primary market is children below the age of 12? What would be the best marketing strategy? This is a really good question. You have to remember who is buying the book. 
Are kids under 12 buying the book? No, their parents are. So yes is the answer to the first part of your question because absolutely you use the same uh, marketing strategy, which is you put together a special bonus, you set a date, you get together um, partners or team members that are gonna help you launch it. All of this I teach in my Epitome Author Program. So absolutely you follow that same strategy. Okay, the next question is from Eva. Is it normal now for people to write the screenplay? I thought that was a separate art. Great question, Eva. Is it normal? I don't think there's anything normal anymore, <laughs> right? There's nothing normal anymore. What's normal? Um, so is it normal now? It's probably going to become more normal uh, if, to, to go that way. But again, you know, it has to be structured. Like I, I find this when you're working with chat GPT, it, it's think of this expression, garbage in, garbage out, right? It's going to structure things based on what you ask or what you put in. Like when I was working for the, on the screenplay for Savvy Wisdom, I was having fun. But at one point, chat GPT was just pumping out some stuff that didn't make sense and i'm typing back like what are you doing like this is why did you call that person that name that's not even the name in the book and and it's like you're having a an argument with somebody it was kind of fun and uh so this is going back and forth back and forth and then i'd ask it for something and then i do the scene it's like well what happened to that you left that out it was in before and now you've left it out and 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 denny heard me in my office because i'm actually talking to my computer you know as if there's a human there and he's like what's going on in there and it's like they're not cooperating <laughs> and so you know you'll find that sometimes it doesn't cooperate the way you want but it's based on the guidance you're giving it right so once i you know got it, it meaning chat gpt back on track that it's like pumping up oh okay good job all right you're doing it right now and you know i really want to thank you for that so you have to give it the right guidance in order to uh produce the right results so i would say that it's probably going to become more normal but as I said, maybe 25, 30 minutes ago, when we think about Hollywood or we think about the industry, the movie industry, the entertainment industry, they are business. They're in business, right? They're in business to earn money. That's how businesses stay in business. That's how studios stay active and grow and, and thrive. And therefore, if you can help them in some way by bringing them a great potential story and you've helped them by even maybe um, eliminating a step to have that screenplay done, then good for you because it's going to be good for them. It's good for them. So it'll be good for you as well. All right. Our next question is uh, Victoria says, do you contact movie companies with a synopsis like a query for publishers? How do you contact Pixar, for example? Uh, that's a good question. That's definitely a Phil Goldfine question. Um, I happen to have a good friend who's in Hollywood who runs a, a movie production company. So that's how I approach. And of course, Phil and I do programs together. And uh, so, but as far as do you contact movie companies with a synopsis, like a query for a publisher, I don't think that's generally the way um, that you do it. But I'm going to go to chat GPT and ask it. This is what I would do. I would say so. OK, so it says, yes, contacting movie companies like Pixar, Pixar involves a similar approach to querying publishers. But there are some key differences in the process. So here's how you can go about contacting movie companies. You create a professional pitch package, which includes the logline, the synopsis, the script and visual material, if you have it. And then you uh, research submission policies, which are all online, like big studios, including Pixar, do not accept unsolicited submissions from individuals due to legal reasons, but they want you to come through an agent. It's either an agent, a lawyer, or an entertainment manager. That's usually the way. That's what I thought it was. I mm -hmm. thought it was an agent that was required. And... Um, you know, and what one of the things that ChatGPT is saying is attend industry events, right, and pitch sessions. So when when we were in Hollywood last week, that's one of the things that we did was we had pitch sessions with our participants for our, our program. And um, so that was one way. That's what Mark Wallace did. You know, Mark Wallace came to an event that I did and, and he did, he pitched his idea, which... Um, 
Phil absolutely loved and he decided to, uh, you know, to uh, move forward with him on that. So he here's Mark. <laughs> hey, Mark. Hey. <laughs> Mark's a pretty easygoing guy. So I thought, let's bring Mark into the, rather than me talk about Mark. And look at his office, guys. Look behind him. You know, he's got his Academy Award. He's got, look at his lamp. I love it. And what's on his wall. So, Mark, um, share a little bit about what what it's been like for you on this interesting journey and and start with, like, what inspired you to even do this or move down this uh, area? Because you're a retired veterinarian. Yes, I was a veterinarian for 40 years, so I, I didn't have a writing background or anything. I had some interest when I was in high school, but the guidance counselor said, you know, less than 200 people in the United States make a good living on writing full time. Uh, I don't know. He kind of squashed my dream then. But it resurfaced when I retired. So about a year ago, I was where many of you are right now. I was uh, sitting in this webinar and I decided to go ahead and take the author program. And it was the best thing I ever did. So if you're feeling a little uncomfortable for it, that's why you should move forward and do it because that's where your growth is going to be if you move forward. But ideas are always looking for suitable host. And if you're here, it's because you're, you're meant to be here. But for me, the um, it, it has really... The more I keep moving forward, the more um, ideas and, and doors keep opening. Like, I didn't have any idea. This was a C-type goal or a goal that you don't know how it's going to manifest itself. But when you keep walking forward, you keep meeting more people and more doors keep opening. So the things that have happened in the last year to me are just about unbelievable. But just keep following your dream and sure. keep keep pers pursuing it. Um and, and everything will work out okay. But yeah. Peggy's been, uh, yeah, Pe and I've taken a, a number of her courses and that's what you want to do. You want to get with people that have the experience because you don't want to take 10, 20, 30 years to figure this out. So you can compress time and you can get with people that already know how you want to, how, how to go forward. So Peggy and Phil are both the examples. Phil's been in Hollywood for 30 years. He knows how all of it works. Peggy's got books that she's had out now for 20 or 30 years. You, you don't want to have to go reinvent the wheel. You want to get with these people and compress time. And mm. then within, I don't know, maybe a year, you also have something ready for, for Hollywood or for your own, for your own book you're, that you're proud of that you want to bring to the world. I love that, Mark. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you. That was so kind of you to do that. And, you know, as I said, I this was not planned. Mark didn't know I was going to bring him in. Sherry didn't know I was going to bring her in. It's So just be on the edge of your seat, guys. I might be bringing into the spotlight here. But thanks, Mark. I appreciate you. It's really, a, really wonderful to have you. And that's another thing that's really interesting. Like, Mark, Sherry, you know, we've used two people that are already successful by their own right. And here they are listening in, right? Gathering more information. So I love that. I love that about you. That's very much what I'm like. I'm hungry, hungry, hungry for more, more information, more knowledge. Why? Because it helps you grow. But, you know, I want you to really listen to what Mark said about being uncomfortable. That was so brilliant because what did he say? He said, it's when you're uncomfortable, that's where the growth is right? That's absolutely where the growth is. And I know all about that, Mark. So I love that. It's so good. So good. Good for you. Okay. We, st we still have about seven minutes remaining and, and we still have a few more questions. These are great questions, by the way. Thank you for grabbing them all, Roddy. I really appreciate that. Okay. So Diane is asking the question. Um, I'm not sure I understand the concept of someone being a ghostwriter. Why would you want to write a book for someone else? This is a good question. And then that person gets all the credit, becomes well known if the book is a success and the actual writer remains completely unknown. Okay, this is so important um, that you really understand this. And, and that is this. When I first became an author, I learned a very valuable statistic. And the statistic was that when you're an author and you've released your book to the world, 5% of your job is done. Now think about that for a moment, because it may seem like a lot of work. The 95% of author success comes from the marketing, right? You have to learn how to market it. So a ghostwriter is somebody who's who, in many cases, is one of the only people that's earning money, right? Like if the book doesn't fly, it's the author's risk. 
you know, I think about what I paid for ghostwriters years and years ago when I was using them. I remember calculating it one day, and I think it was somewhere around a hundred grand that I had paid for ghostwriters to write my book. And now I've earned a lot more than that over the years, but you know, the risk was all mine. It really was mine. So why would someone write a book? Because they get paid, because they earn money. That's the reason why they do it is so that they can earn some money and they have no risk. Their risk is all on the author. That's the answer. So great question. Thank you for asking. All right. We got two more questions. Oh, no, three more questions here. Uh, Rhea says, I am also interested in the process. Do you? Oh, yeah. OK, so that was the process. I had answered that question earlier. You may need to get an agent or a um, entertainment lawyer. They they are people or Hang out with people that know people. That also works. Um, Paul is asking a question. I know you write your book in Word. Yes. Is it later possible into a book template? Would you suggest using the Amazon book template? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you could certainly transfer it later into the template. Like Amazon, if you're uploading your book into what's called Kindle Direct Publishing, which is their self-publishing arm, then they have a particular format that they want you to abide by in order to get your book approved and then made available for sale. So Word is where most people, or Pages, I think some people use that as well. <clears throat> okay, Barbara is saying, I've started reading... Uh, million Dollar Author Blueprint. Oh, massive thank you. Well, you're very welcome, Barbara. I love that you've already dove into that. And you mentioned the importance of building a brand with or from your book. My idea is for a fiction book. However, it's really based on mindset and possibilities. Could I still build, build a brand from that too? Definitely, you can still build a brand from that too. Now, it depends on the book. I mean, the, it could be based on the book or may not be based on the book. Might be completely separate from that. A uh, couple examples are like Savvy Wisdom, even though it's fiction, and I wrote it as, as three novels, I actually created a course called Savvy's Proven Success Principles. And it and because the book's very positive, like the way that Vladdy likes to write and read, and me too. And so because the book's very positive, it has a lot of very valuable life lessons in it. And so I pulled the, the goodness out of those books and created a, a course from it. Um, Aidy, who is on this uh, call with us right now, who's written a book called Starter Husband, who's uh, just getting ready to uh, officially release it, same thing. I mean, Aidy wrote her novel inspired by her real life event and her real life experiences. And could she create something and build a brand around resilience? Absolutely. You know, could she call herself the queen of resilience? And uh, certainly she could do something like that. But even so, let's say, you know, there's an author who's writing fiction in the same category or genre as uh, uh, Erica Mitchell, right? Which I forget what that genre is called. Somebody probably knows. Anyways, but yet they're they're also in another space, like their business is in another space. Could you do both things at the same time? Sure. Absolutely. You could be doing both things at the same time and building another another type of brand. Oh, we got another question that snuck in there, Roddy, a little sneaky, sneaky. Okay, so we've got three minutes left. Um, Munsa says, how can I deal with imposter syndrome? Sometimes I feel so good about my book. Sometimes I feel I'm a fake and everyone is gonna criticize me. I don't feel comfortable in social media. Very common, by the way, that is a very common, I've heard that question asked many, 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 many times. And that is an opportunity to really build your own confidence. It's a self-esteem issue is what it is. And it really comes down to just believing in yourself. And if it's not there, that's okay. Because like a muscle, you can just build it and build it and build it by impressing that you're valuable. Your messages are valuable. Your words are valuable. Your book is valuable. You know, I felt that way. I had a lot of trepidation, trepidation as well before I released my first book. Like, who am I? You know, those kinds of questions were going on in my own consciousness. But, you know, you got to feel it and go for it anyway. But anytime you feel anything that doesn't feel comfortable to you, mm -hmm. recognize that it's always, always an opportunity for growth. It's always an opportunity to step into a greater and grander version of, of who you are. As Mark Wallace was mentioning just a few minutes ago, I totally get that. You know, as Mark was saying that, I, I just had a flashback in my mind to 2012. I was standing in the, the bathroom at a uh, hotel in Los Angeles. I was at the Marriott Hotel and we were starting an event 
And this was the Making a Million Look Small event that I was doing with my good friend, Bob Proctor, Mary Morrissey and Gay Hendricks. And I mean, as I mentioned the other day, I mean, I love those guys. I love their their style. I love the way that they spoke and delivered on stage. And and we we're doing an event where it was the four of us. And and I was on first. And I remember standing in the mirror and just ha- almost like hyperventilating, like, oh, Jesus, oh, my God, I'm about to share the stage with these, you know, great speakers and teachers and 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 it was just like a you know where you have a little devil and an angel on your shoulder you know like one's talking to you going who do you think you are to go on stage with these guys well who do you think you are and you know you got your own style and you know and so that's you know I had to stop listening to the one that was being nasty you know just stop that stop it you know like that little video and and don't listen to that because you know, you got to understand that there's going to be thoughts that you have, there's going to be feelings that you have that are definitely not going to support you. But I'll tell you something, and and I'm certain that many that are on here that have already produced results can understand. Like when you do move into action, you're going to find that it really makes a difference. It helps you grow, you know, and, and I think you have to be willing to be vulnerable. You really do have to be willing to be vulnerable and, and get out there. Like I suspect Erica James must have been pretty vulnerable when she released her, her first book in the series. And yet at the end of the day or at the end of the eight months, you know, with her $95 million in her pocket, do you think she really cared as much, you know, at that time? And so that's really what it's all about. So we're at the, uh, the end of our, our, well, not the end of our time together, but we're, <laughs> we are uh, going to wrap up our event here. I'm going to bring in the most amazing team that I've ever been blessed to uh, work with. And, you know, this is one of the blessings of, you know, doing this work is, you know, who you're surrounded with. And I'm surrounded by greatness every day with these amazing beings who, like, I think about Roddy, he's been busting his butt for you guys this week, guys, like, really, you know, it's, uh, what time is it there in Scotland for you, Roddy? Oh, we can't hear you. Sorry, we're just after um, eight o'clock, but I uh, really appreciate your your kindness, Peggy. And it's not as brilliant um, to see everybody here today, especially for the folks that have you know, stayed with it over the three, the, the three days. Uh, the feedback that we've got has been really excellent and it, it makes it all the worthwhile. Love seeing the, the chat box going there too, with all the positive uh, feedback. Um, the surveys as well too that you filled in again very much appreciated it's great to kind of see where you're at and where you're you're looking for help with as well too um, I know a number of you have booked calls as well with uh, the two magnificent authors in uh, Kayla and Vladi so again like we've we've said during the course of these three days don't be scared to reach out for help uh, one of the great things that I've learned about authors is authors love helping authors and you're dealing with two great authors and, and Kayla and uh, Vladi and of course Peggy who are all here to help and um, support you. So let's, as I say, keep the conversation going. This was a three day event, but it, it could uh, turn out to be a lot longer and a lot more profitable and beneficial for you <laughs> all. So and that's what we want. We want your success. And that's why uh, these three days were designed were designed for you and personally it's been a real uh, pleasure to be alongside you for the, the three days so thank you so much I love it thank you so much I really appreciate it Kayla do you have any uh, last words to share and then we'll go to Vladdy <laughs> well I have a, a question how many uh, like how many of you after this call feel more inspired to move forward with your book right in the chat box we'd love to hear from you um let us know, like, how many of you think that now is the time as a possibility to write your book? That's so I love good. that. I love that. And we, we love to hear, hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just say that one out loud. <laughs> that beats now, says Donna. I love that. That's so good. I love it. I love oh, it. Moni, I so, want the book and the movie. I love it. Good for you. <laughs> and it's definitely, it's definitely a possibility. So knowing that, knowing that you're feeling inspired, knowing that you're in this momentum and this vibration now, how many of you would be willing to hop on a free call with us? Mm. Like answer, answer honestly, how many of you would be willing to hop on and let me just say a free strategy call with Vladia and I just, yeah. you know, just to get a little bit more information, 
to understand a little bit better. Yes, you did book Victoria. I love that. I love that. Yeah, me. Yeah. So perfect. Roddy's gonna Roddy's gonna put the link in the chat box for you, and I want you to take that step. That's the next step. These are free calls. This is Vladdy and I taking our time out of our day to commit to you, to commit our time to you because we believe in you. So if you believe in yourself, take the time, book a call with us. We'd love to hear from you. You know, you spent these three days with us. You committed your time. We believe in you. So take the time, book a call with us. We'd love to hear from you. I want to hear your stories and I want to help you along the way. I love that, Kayla. And Tiffany says, one of the calls. Well, when you click on their book a call button, it'll give you options. So they've got lots of availability. I shouldn't say lots, but they got availability. <laughs> Vladdy? I'm going to say this. There is a reason why you're all here. And I thought about this today. When we want to learn cooking, we go to chef. When we go to exercise, we go to that. So there is a reason that called you in to be here. And the reason is there is something within you. You either want to market your book or write a book or whatever it is, but you are here. And we can be thinking about the releasing weight and do nothing about it. What happens? Nothing. If we want to change the way we look outside, we have to change something. If you want to write a book, it's not going to get done by doing nothing. You know, you can sit there and go, hmm, but nothing's going to happen. So if the hardest part is make a decision, be committed to yourself and really just take that one step you can today. Come up with the title join Peggy's programs or speak to us. It's up to you really what you do, but we're here to really serve you if you want to be served. And that's what's really great because you have the choice. But just think, why are you here? You came because there is something within you that wants to move forward to, you may be thinking about this for a long time, maybe it's an instantaneous idea, regardless of what it is, just really take action without action with that nothing is done and don't get scared because i really want you to think of this if you want to declutter the house which i have done in the last four months it doesn't happen in a day you cannot do it in a day every day you commit to do a little bit and then you look at the stuff you've done in a month and two and three and it's remarkable so what can you do every day and to hold your book, maybe by Christmas or in January, like it really is up to you. You can do it as fast or slow. I'm going to not encourage slow, but I'm going to say that <laughs> it is really your choice. But take action without the taking daily committed action. You just can't have a see the result. So I'd say that this is really important for all, especially authors. Oh, I love that. Thank you so much, Vladi and Kayla and Roddy. It was so great. Love serving with you. And Vladdy, yes, you have a sexy accent too. <laughs> Kayla, we got to get an accent. <laughs> All right. Well, everyone have a wonderful day. We look forward to being with you again and serving you and uh, get those calls booked. We would love to uh, help you turn your dreams into reality. So thank you, everyone. And I really want to also thank Mark and, and Sherry for being willing to jump into the spontaneously jump into the uh, room. Uh, with us here today. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you again soon.